We just finished up a live schematic review with a bunch of our members. It was a ton of fun. I thought I would post the highlights here on YouTube. Check the description to get a link to the schematic. Let's go. So kit on a shield, what the heck is it? Well, just so you know, this is the kit on a shield. It's a, uh, as you probably know, a shield, or as you may know, a shield when in Arduino speak is simply a circuit board that fits on top of another, usually like we'd call like a controller board. So in this case, the kit on a shield is designed for the same footprint as an Arduino Uno. So it works with Arduino Uno R3s, Arduino Megas. And so here's, here's an Arduino Uno, right? And then it would just fit in like so, just like this. So some of you may have a kit on a shield, you might heard about one, but uh, this is, so this is the circuit board that we're gonna be talking about that um, this schematic kind of speaks to. The, the correct language is that you read a schematic, but that's kind of wrong because you don't read a drawing, you don't read a painting, right? Like this, you're, you're, you're viewing it, you're scanning it visually. So when I, when I look at this right here, if you think about your Arduino code or your C code, uh, you could think of the way like a for loop gets indented. Right. Like, and if the, the for loop in C doesn't have to actually be indented, you could put it all on a single line if you wanted to, or you could you know have it do an S curve if you wanted to, and it would still function perfectly correctly. But anybody looking at it would have no idea what that code was doing just by quickly looking at the page. They would have to sit there and really like pull the threads apart to understand exactly what this thing is doing, as opposed to indenting it correctly, in which case anybody can look at it and go, oh, that's a for loop. Here's where it starts. Here's where it ends. And in right. this case, okay. like, this, is where the, this is where the current comes in. This is where the current goes out. I can see that immediately there. If I need to know more about it, now I can dig into a thing that I already know the purpose of. What I really want to focus on here is that the schematic itself is designed to be clear and easy to understand because the idea was that it would get printed and then placed into the textbook that goes with the kit on a shield. Uh, so consequently, uh, it's very fortunate for us that all of the different circuits that we put on there were all able to fit into one page. For more complex designs, you might have uh, hierarchical pages where you have sort of an, an, a big overview page and then some pages beneath that that, that link uh, sort of, you know, trying to fit everything onto a single, you know, A4 size piece of paper, eight and a half by 11 is typically not possible. Uh, but fortunately for us, I was able to get it all onto this one page. It used to be that when you bought a piece of electronics equipment, you could write to the company that manufactured it and ask them to send you a copy of the schematic and they would do so happily. And you would get a copy of the schematic that if you were lucky was a single letter sized piece of paper. More often it was, you know, poster size. And uh, you, know, you get this 24 inch by 36 inch uh, schematic that's got the entire layout on it. Uh, and that becomes very challenging to try to figure out where one thing interconnects to another. Uh, so in this case, what I've done is I've broken everything out into subsystems because that seemed to be the, the really best way of communicating uh, in, in logical form what each system was supposed to be doing. I know there was one of the questions that was sent to us beforehand uh, was, uh, you know, what makes a good schematic versus a bad schematic? And uh, I, that gets to the point of what is a schematic's purpose? And it's a little bit different in the 21st century because this is now not just a, a logical reference for your design, but this is the way that you, you use the other half of the software to actually connect everything together. But for me, a schematic is supposed to be the logical representation of what the physical circuit board does. So it's important that I can look at this and I can see visual patterns in this that indicate to me what something is doing. So for example, I look at this and this tells me that the current is going into the LED, it's going from the LED into the resistor and it's going from the resistor to ground because the convention is power comes in from the top, power goes out the bottom. Oh, okay, that's interesting. I don't think I realized that. And then signals, typically come in from the left and will exit out the right. So if I wanted to be you know, very, very stringent, I would have taken this ground here and I would put it over here to indicate all of the signals coming in from the left and all of it going out on the right. And in this case, it's current coming through the LED and the resistor. There is no requirement. There is nobody that will ever tell you that you're supposed to comment your schematic, but you absolutely should. So this is a prime example right here. I could have this in notepad or maybe in an Excel spreadsheet or written down on a piece of paper and I will completely forget what that note was referring to. But what I can do is I can just put a note like a comment into my schematic and have it indicate this was my thought process when I picked this component. This is what happened while I was testing it. And then I can just save it into the schematic and now it's there as a reference for me uh, in the future. And this in particular, I do to a great extent in, in more complex designs because as the subsystems grow and grow and grow, you'll just start to forget all the work that you had done on a previous circuit. Yeah, so you're kind of paying, you're paying your own self forward, you're just doing yourself a favor by taking the time to do it. And you know, I feel like for this design specifically, it's come in handy because we've done multiple revisions. You know what I mean? This this product has been out for a, a long time. I know one of the questions from uh, Delosh, I think it was he, he went by D. He had said, you know, hey, so what? You know, what's the difference between a good schematic and a bad schematic? And you're kind of mentioning, well, you know, it's kind of it, you know, following sounded like following good conventions can you know point towards a schematic that's maybe a little better visually to read. Was there anything else you wanted to mention about that, Dan? The the important thing about the schematic is that you can tell what the circuit does just by looking at it, and the only way you can do that is by you know by you know for want of a better phrase by using good handwriting, right? Like you mm -hmm. want the thing to look like the way it's been constantly drawn in the past. The way that you and I developed this schematic was you and I sat down, we had a conversation about what we wanted this design to do. And from that, I built a block diagram. And the block diagram is, I mean, it's, it, it does exactly what's right there on the tin. It's a diagram of blocks. And those blocks were uh, each individual subsystem. And then within those subsystems, there was another block. And those blocks were the components necessary to achieve the goal of whatever that subsystem was supposed to be. So for right. example- Yeah, and if I recall, you did it in Excel, right? Didn't you do the block diagram in Excel? I think so, yeah. yeah I'm pretty sure PowerPoint. Well, right. uh, and so you would have the block for the, uh, for the LED subsystem. So there was just a big block that's an LED subsystem. And then within that block, there were smaller blocks that said LED and resistor because you knew that is what you would need for that uh, for that schematic or for that part of the of the circuit. And when you have all of that stuff set up, it makes it very easy to just come in here and create that logical representation of what you want the physical to be. I know I want to have a bunch of lit up LEDs, so let me just add those components in here in a way that makes me look at it and go, okay, here I have seven LEDs, here I have seven resistors. They're connected from the pin of the Arduino and they're connected to ground. And then I go through and I do that for all the subsystems and then go through a process of uh, of 
uh, checks, tests and checks to make sure that everything is connected correctly, that the power is going to the power input, that the ground is connected to the ground, that I don't have anything weirdly interconnected. And fortunately, in the modern day, that's all done through automated tools. Hey, we got a, we got a question from uh, Colton. And um, hey, Colton, correct me if I'm wrong. Actually, I think maybe I can show this here. Okay, let's see. What's the best software to use with simulation to give corrective advice? Any thoughts on that? I'm, I'm thinking maybe he's referring to um, during the, um, maybe during this phase when you're drawing the schematic. I don't right. know if they have simulators for that. I, I don't know. So uh, there are there are a couple ways of uh, doing circuit simulation. Um, I think there's 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 one that is very visual uh, with I think it's Wacky. Oh yeah, for the, you know, right. Yep, where you can, yeah, where you can build up uh, uh, like visual representations of your circuit, <clears throat> and and just see what happens when you hook it up. Um, but for like real circuit simulation, there's there's sort of a, another tier uh, above that, and then another tier above that. So uh, there is one uh, particular tool called Falstad, F A L S T A D. Uh, that I'm sure if you Google around enough for electronics over the years, you will eventually run across a false ad simulation. Uh, and it's the it's the one where uh, where the current is shown as like the dancing line of ants okay. uh, in uh, in the circuit. And they, it is a remarkably uh, fully implemented circuit simulator. You can you can get voltage out of it, you can get current out of it, you can have little uh, oscilloscope traces down at the bottom, and it comes with a whole bunch of pre built circuits in there that you can uh, that you can just pull up and see how it works. Uh, so that's F A L S T A D false ad. Uh, in fact, I don't know why I'm saying it when I can just uh, type that into the comment. There we go. Uh, so it's not the easiest tool to use, but it's by far not the hardest tool to use. Uh, it has very generic parts in there because you can imagine even just for something as simple as an LED, an LED might have, you know, from one manufacturer versus another might have a different forward voltage. Uh, it might have a uh, different internal resistance. There's a, there's a number of uh, characteristics for everything that can be generalized and they run with the sort of generalized version of the, of the component definitions. Uh, but once you sort of get the hang of how to put things together, uh, it's a really fun tool to use. Um, then the next level above that is something called SPICE. Uh, which is an acronym that I've long forgotten what SPICE means. Uh, the one that is most commonly used is called LT Spice uh, because it was originally developed by Linear Technologies. And uh, in that program, there are many individual components that have been completely characterized. So basically, they take the entire data sheet and they turn it into metadata for the component that you're using. And with that tool, you can do very, very detailed analysis of, uh, of what a very complex circuit is doing. I know a lot of people have been talking about, hey, you know, what would you use to make the schematic? What software are you using? Right. And is it, so I know you're using KiCad, if I'm not mistaken, right. or KiCad. KiCad uh, if you're European. Okay. And so that's an open source software for designing um, circuit boards. And am I correct in saying that that is called an EDA tool or am I off on that acronym? Yes. Usually when I'm running into a schematic, it is because I have got, I bought some module, right? I bought some module and it's got some other integrated circuits on it. And I'm trying to figure out like, well, what is, maybe I don't have a data sheet on whatever this thing I bought, but I do have a schematic perhaps. And I'm trying to figure out like, well, hey, what part number are they using or what part are they using? So then I can look at the data sheet for that specific part and then know like, okay, hey, what I'm going to do, what I'm thinking about doing might work or something like that. So that's, I guess that's usually how I'm thinking about, you know, a schematic. And so when I, you know, I'm opening up a schematic, how do I know, are there usually going to be references to what the, the different blobs are on there? I can see that there's like some yellow things on here. Um, right. And so I'm assuming like part number is going to kind of be on that generally. Uh, yes and no. Uh, you know, everybody can, can draw a good schematic. Everybody can draw a bad schematic. Uh, the, the convention is that if it is a very common part, like this LED uh, here, right? Like I don't have a part number listed in the schematic. So if I print this out, you won't know what the color of this LED is. You won't know what the forward voltage is. All you'll know is that this is an LED and this is a resistor that's 330 ohms. And maybe you can tell that this is a resistor network rather than a discrete resistor because it's like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But other than that, it's such a common part that if you wanted to recreate the circuit, you could use any LED and you could use any resistor. That's I'm almost saying like does it, this doesn't matter. If I'm not putting the specifics in there, it's because I think you don't need to know that in order to understand what the circuit is doing. Oh, okay, gotcha. So it might, it might be too verbose in that Correct. case. Okay. So over here, however, you know, we can look at the debout circuit. Or yeah, this is the debout circuit. If I don't have this information here, uh, I just you know sort of drag that out of the way. Now you're left clueless as to really what's going on here because this is there's so much detail contained in the representation of this integrated circuit right here that you, you can't possibly know everything from just the drawing. So it's very important that this gets the part number supplied with it in the schematic. Okay. So gotcha. now I can go, oh, okay, so I don't know what this does, but here's the part number. So now I can go use that to look up the data sheet and figure out specifically how this works. I know because I've got it annotated up here that this is a debounced button. And I see that there's there's a capacitor and there is a button and there's this block. And I, you know, from my experience, I look at this uh, capacitor and I go, that's probably a bypass capacitor. It's just standard filtering. You see that on every integrated circuit everywhere. And this is the button. So since this is a debounce input, this must be the thing that's doing the debouncing. So that's what I'll expect when I go look up this part number. Okay. So basically, all right. So I might, maybe I'm used to, you know, maybe I'm used to looking at a lot of schematics. I might just by context be able to figure out like, oh, I know what that, you know, oh, that's going to be a linear voltage regulator, you know, X, Y, Z. But um, if I'm not, or if maybe there's some details about that, then I'm going to have that part number. I can now reference it. So I should almost expect, I should expect that I'm going to, when I'm reading a schematic, it's very likely that I will be needing, if I'm really trying to understand this, I'm going to need to refer to a data sheet, right? Correct. And so I would just be Googling, you know, APX 823 and find a data sheet. And then that's going to tell me a little bit about it. Okay. So I know I can tell from your schematic that this part was made by U2, right? The band made this. Is that, is that what, what's the U2 for? I'm curious. I know somebody else had, had that question too. Right. Uh, that is, that is my bad joke for the day. Thank you. <laughs> I'm trying, uh, I'm trying to deliver wow. bad, bad uh, So. Uh, the, the U designation is typically used for integrated circuits or for uh, anything that's more complex, like a bunch of functionality built into a single block. So in this case, this is a, a debounce button. Uh, in this case over here, this is the actual Arduino, right? Uh, up here, this is the temperature sensor. So the U designation, there's a there's a bunch of, of possible definitions as to what that is. As far as I am aware, the, the real reason why it's called a U has been lost in time. I think of it as meaning unit, like, in, like, a, like this is a single unit of functionality. 
and that's why it gets the U designation. Typically, you see that with uh, with microcontrollers and integrated circuits, um, okay. unless they unless they're for you know unless they're an exception where it's already through convention been decided that it gets a uh, it gets its own uh, reference called a reference designator. A reference designator. Okay, this is from Richard. He said, um, "You've got GNDA and GNDD. Do those go to different ground points on the PCB?" Um, right. so I don't know if you could just kind of show us what you're. I, I do see like right now where we're at. I see a GNDA, and um, what is the, what is the? I know GND is ground. Um, right. So you have GNDD here. So ground delta, ground digital. Okay, ground digital. GNDA, GND alpha. This is ground analog. So uh, this is there's a this is a way for me when I'm designing the circuit and when I'm looking at it now to I don't I'm not really thinking about the physical layout of the PCB. What I'm seeing is that this is an analog system. So I'm sensing a voltage here or I'm sensing a current versus this over here where I'm expecting this to just be digital. This is a bunch of ones and zeros that I'm sending through here. And I might need to condition it or filter it a little bit, uh, but for the most part, this isn't doing any sensing and the voltage level is either going to be ground or five volts in this case. Over here, this is going to be an analog signal. So I see that it's going to be starting at five volts, but especially since this is a potentiometer, the, the voltage is going to be some range in between zero volts and five volts. I already know that's a potentiometer. So what's the deal with pot one? Because it already has a designator, right? It's got that RV one, that would be variable resistor one. Right. So I'm trying to, I'm just like, you know, the pot one thing, that's like a, it's like a flag or something like that telling me it's coming from somewhere, I'm assuming? In fact, that's called a global flag. A global flag, okay. Meaning that anything in my schematic that has this item connected to it will wind up being interconnected in the actual circuit board. So anything that has this connection made will we'll need to have copper connected to it once I finally go to lay out the circuit board. So one of the things that my, my, my checking software does is tell me if there is a global flag that's isolated, meaning there's only one of them. These should always have more than one because it's got to be connected somewhere. So this right here must have somewhere on the schematic a matching pot zero one. And I, and I know because I'm very familiar with design that that is over here in the analog side and there's its matching pair. It's pot zero one. Okay, so basically that's like a little mental wormhole. I can say like, okay, hey, one there, pot one, that connects up to the to the top right where we were at. So like those are points of connection. So correct. you could have multiple pot ones all over the place potentially, and they're all literally physically going to be connected. That's correct. Okay, so let me let me run to. I've got. I just want to make sure we're hitting all these questions before we close this up. All right. So somebody wanted to know. I think it was Christiane. Um, there are some symbols on the Arduino, um, the Arduino Uno R3 right. representation. Um, and again, this I'm assuming that because the Canon Shield does not have an Arduino Uno on it, right? That's just like a reference for you know looking at it, right? Yeah, this um, represents the pinout for the Arduino Uno right here. The Arduino Uno R3 is this thing. Doesn't ship on the board, right? I just right. need to know that this is what it's connecting to. And okay, in fact, gotcha. when you're looking at the schematic, all these little blue X's mean disconnected, not connected. Oh, okay, okay. So it's like a NC, then not connected. Right. Not connected, right. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so on, on the board, I noticed that uh, you've got that pie in front of some of the digital pins on the right, right there. What is what is what are you telling us there, or what is that? Uh, that just means that this pin is capable of PWM. Okay, and that's just something you're like, I got to come up with something. You, you just came up with the P pi pulse with module. Okay, correct. Gotcha. Because uh, you're making decisions as you build it, right? Like, I mean, this is just right. So in, when it comes to schematics, there's no convention for indicating that something is capable of PWM, but there, there is a, a convention that's very important, and you will see it in data sheets and schematics all the time. Uh, I don't know if we have one on here, but I can create one super. Yeah, right here. So this bar over the word, so this bar over MR, this bar under reset or bar over reset means that that signal is active low. Hopefully we'll do this again, Dan. You know, if you're up for doing this again, we'll look at some other schematics. Hopefully we can make this kind of a regular thing uh, to have you know members uh, join us and we can talk about these different schematics. And I know this one we talked we talked very generally. I feel like about schematics this time around, which is I, I like to do a lot. Maybe uh, next time we can talk more specific about some of the circuits in a schematic. And sure. I know one in particular that I think will be fun to talk about. Perhaps maybe the next one we do is we're kind of talking about doing another kit on a shield, but one that is like an IoT one. And so instead of actually being a shield, it's actually its own. Um, it would have its own integrated circuit on an ESP32. If you're not familiar with that, it is a inexpensive, highly powerful Wi-Fi and Bluetooth enabled uh, microcontroller. So maybe that would be a fun thing just to look at. It's still very you know beta and stuff, but it would be it might be fun to look at some of the stuff on there. I, I'm sure I would look, learn a lot. So. Um, everybody, you know, keep your eyes out. Uh, maybe we'll do this again. Again, if you want to check out the schematic we're talking about, check the link in the description. And hey, if you want to participate in one of these live schematic reviews, you know, this is something, like I said, we had a bunch of our members there with us. We had a bunch of, you know, questions coming in. It was a lot of fun participation. Uh, had a lot of great feedback. So it was a great time. If you want to, you know, you're interested in doing something like this, check out programmingelectronics.com, become a member, and uh, you can join us too. See ya.